Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicholas Lanigan. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Waterloo. I'm from the chemistry department, and uh, I work under the supervision of uh, Professor Xiaosong Wang. And I'm really happy to be here today to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, my PhD research. And the title of my talk is going to be The Truss Arrangement of Iron Atoms in Supermolecular Polymers. So just to begin, I'll give a quick little outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. I'll sort of give a brief introduction to some important concepts such as polymers, supermolecular polymers, and how do we go about actually studying supermolecular polymers. I'll talk a little bit about the design of some of the molecule of the design of one of the molecules I've been working on, and I'll talk a little bit about how do we identify the chain structure, its polymer behavior, and then I'll talk about a few of the preliminary results that uh, we've got for using this particular compound in printed electronics. All right, so uh, what is a polymer? Now, a polymer is a macromolecule that consists of uh, smaller components called monomers, which are linked through covalent interactions. And these monomers um, sort of link together, they form a very long chain. And if we looked at these at the microscopic scale, they're gonna entangle like spaghetti. Um, and thanks to the wide variety of monomers we're able to synthesize and different ways we can tailor the physical properties of polymer, they're found in almost every part of our, our, our daily life. They're found in the, uh, the, uh, the tires of our cars, in our chewing gum, and recently today I saw a floating plastic bag. For example, polyethylene um, forms plastic bags, and they tend to float around a lot, and they generate a lot of pollution, and that's one of the major drawbacks of polymer. Why are they such a problem? Well, because they're challenging to recycle. Part of this challenge comes from the fact that we can't actually very efficiently break these covalent bonds that form the polymer to get our monomers back. The other thing we have to do is disassemble this entangled noodle network we've made. So let's talk a little bit about supermolecular polymers. Now, supermolecular polymers are pretty much analogous to traditional covalent polymers, but instead of using covalent bonds to link our monomers together, we use non-covalent interactions. So a mon monomer would associate with another monomer, forming a dimer, and this process is going to repeat over and over again until we get a very nice long chain. Now these chains get long enough and they eventually can entangle and end up just like your traditional covalent noodle network. Now the one thing I want to talk about is how do supermolecular polymers fit in with nanotechnology? Well what we're trying to do is we're trying to organize molecules, our monomers, which are typically in the nanometer size range into one dimensional nanostructures. Eventually these one dimensional nanostructures, yes they become so long they can entangle with each other, but that's how this kind of fits into nanotechnology. Now I've mentioned non-covalent interactions. Now there's a wide variety of non-covalent interactions that have been used. Some of the most popular happen to be hydrogen bonding. Now hydrogen bonding is where we have hydrogen bonded, covalently bonded to some atom X that's electronegative and this creates a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. Now this partially positive hydrogen can interact, oops, sorry, can interact with a partially negatively charged acceptor giving us this geometry XHA. The other one I want to talk about today is pi-pi interactions. Now, most pi-pi interactions can be described using a really simple electrostatic model. So if we have an aromatic molecule, it's going to have a pi cloud. And these pi clouds are kind of like the buns on a hamburger. So, and then what happens is we get these two negative clouds, and then in the middle we have this positively charged patty. And there's certain geometries where we can get a, a net cohesive interaction. An example of one of these geometries is what I've shown here, and it's called parallel displaced. Now, there's a lot of other interactions that have been used, um, such as metal ligand and metal metal interactions. So, why do we care about this? Well, supermolecular polymers have a number of important advantages. We can have similar properties, physical properties, as covalent polymers, but because we're using non covalent interactions, which require relatively a lot less energy to disrupt than covalent interactions, it's much easier to break these interactions so they're easier to recycle and they're easier to process. Another really exciting part of this is the fact that because non-covalent interactions can form and break relatively easily, they can respond to stimuli and they can be dynamic. So we get this kind of enhanced functionality, things like self-healing. Some of these non-covalent interactions can be disrupted by certain stimuli, so your polymer will res or supermolecular polymer will respond to that. Now the other really interesting thing that happens is because we're ordering these molecules in one direction, we get this sort of residual order, which ends up imparting sort of some anisotropy to the material, you know, and you can get some pretty interesting electronic properties out of that. But what are the drawbacks? Well, right now, uh, the biggest problem is, is that many of these supermolecular polymer systems only exist in solution. 
which is a really big problem because we don't live in a solution. So to find something that's going to work in everyday life, we need to work in the solid state. Now working in the solid state is actually quite challenging and uh, because there's a few requirements on the monomer. The first of which is we need complementary directional interactions so our molecules are going to order in one dimension. They also are going to have to have the mobility to arrange and orientate themselves to make these complementary directional interactions. But at the same time, we have to stop three-dimensional ordering, which is called crystallization. And we have to carefully balance these three aspects in order to organize our structure into a one-dimensional chain. If we increase the complementary uh, directional interactions too much, what will happen is, is we might lose mobility. And if we make the molecules too mobile, we might get crystallization. So we need to carefully balance all three of these in order to achieve a one-dimensional chain. Most people get around the mobility and crystallization aspect by adding, a, by adding a solvent, but we can't do that for solid state supermolecular polymers. So how do we study these things? That's actually a really great question, um, and it involves a lot of uh, X-ray diffraction and single crystal work. The first step is we need to prepare single crystals. The next step is we need to solve the single crystal structure through X-ray diffraction, and that does two things. Once we solve the single crystal structure, using something called short contact analysis, we're able to identify the intermolecular interactions available to these molecules. Then, if, uh, what we can do is we can propose a chain structure, a way these molecules can associate in one dimension, or if we're really lucky, we can even identify a chain structure that might be responsible for polymeric behavior. Now the next step, uh, because this is still in the single crystal, is we need to confirm that the chain structure we predict or observe in the single crystal is going to be responsible for the polymer behavior we observe outside of the single crystal in the amorphous state. So we use things like powdered X-ray diffraction and different spectros spectroscopic techniques to sort of solve that problem. We also need to confirm its polymer behavior because that's what we're trying to do. So we look at things like its thermal behavior and its rheology. So now I'm going to talk a little bit now about the design that goes into one of the, the small molecule monomers that I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, and it's drawn up here. Um, and it has a really long name. It's called carbonyl cyclopentadienyl heptanoyl triphenylphosphine iron. And I'm just going to refer to that as FPC6. So when we look at this, um, we don't immediately see any complementary directional interactions. But we were able to get a, a series of different crystal structures, and we're able to identify sort of three interactions. The first of which comes from the cyclopentadienyl group circled in red. This is going to give us a pi pi interaction. The next two uh, interactions that are involved is circled in blue, we see a carbon monoxide ligand, and in orange, we see an acyl carbonyl group. Now, those two sort of uh, ligands are going to behave as an acceptor for a hydrogen bond. So I've talked a little bit about the interactions, but how are they directional? Because when we look at 2D, I don't really see how they're going to be directional. Now, if we look at a three-dimensional representation of this, what we see is that it is indeed directional. The carbon monoxide ligand points in one direction, the acyl carbonyl in another, and then perpendicular to that, we have the pi-pi interactions. So we've satisfied one out of the three requirements for solid-state supramolecular polymers. Let's talk to here. So we're going to get, in this case, through single crystal structure, we've identified pi pi interactions and CHO hydrogen bonds. Now, what about the other two, mobility and preventing crystallization? Well, the alkyl chain portion here, circled in red, serves both of those purposes. It's going to provide enough mobility to FP6 so that it can orientate itself in the solid state, and it's going to stop or slow crystallization. So when we initially made this molecule, um, we went did a lot of work in trying to figure out what exactly is the chain structure. We grew a lot of single crystals, and it takes a lot of time. Um, and so we were able to, uh, in two of these crystal structures that we got, we were able to identify a chain structure, and using a variety of other techniques, we confirmed its presence in the amorphous state. And the chain structure looks most likely like this. First, we see one um, FPC6 molecule associating with another FPC6 molecule through a parallel displaced pi pi interaction forming a dimer. Now this dimer is going to act as the monomer, and it's going to associate through four CHO hydrogen bonds, which are outlined in the red circles here. Now this process repeats indefinitely, and eventually we get a very long chain. And if we were to link all the carbon iron, carbon, sorry, if we were to link all the iron atoms together, we would get sort of a truss structure. So as soon as we made this material, 
we observed some really cool polymeric behavior. We were able to draw fibers up to 30 centimeters from the melt. We were able to prepare foams. And if we were very careful, we could create very, very large bubbles, kind of like a balloon. We've also characterized this material's uh, um, sort of rheological properties. It's viscoelastic-like uh, polymers. So it's very polymer-like. And we've confirmed the chain structure, like I said, through different techniques. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about ferroelectric materials. So a ferroelectric material is essentially a material that has domains which have a net dipole moment. And in the bulk, what happens is, is that these domains are randomly orientated. But if we had apply an electric field, these domains are going to orientate parallel to the electric field. And if we switch the direction, they'll reverse. And they're aligning again parallel to the electric field. These two different states give you sort of an on and off, which could be used for memory applications in um, sort of uh, in, in computers. So some examples of these materials are listed here. Um, lead zirconate titanate is uh, a ferroelectric uh, material used in uh, FE RAM for computers. Um, barium titanate, um, and a polymer example is polyvinylidene fluoride, or PVDF, and it's also used as a ferro in ferroelectric RAM. But again, there's some drawbacks here. These inorganic materials have extremely high processing temperatures and are incompatible with printed electronics. While there have been some um, demonstrated use of PVDF and ferroelectric RAM in printed electronics, it still remains rather difficult to process. So what we propose, uh, proposed at this point was that because of the one-dimensional order um, in, this, in FPC6, when it forms these chains, it's going to be able to potentially create uh, these sort of net um, dipole domains. And we're going to take advantage of its processability so that we can print it. And then uh, we could make sort of printed tunable um, capacitors or uh, easily printed FE RAM. The other advantage is, is if you printed this on, say, a glass substrate and you made a mistake or you wanted to recycle it, you could just dunk it in a solvent. It would all wash cleanly off and you could evaporate the solvent recovering your material. So it's really easy to recycle. So we went ahead and we uh, printed uh, the material. Um, this is some of the printed material here. Um, and we found that uh, it's definitely printable, um, and it's a great insulator, actually. Um, so it's not conducting or semiconducting. Um, and then we did some capacitance measurements on our, printed, uh, on our printed devices. Unfortunately, the capacitance values we measured were too close to the detection limit of the, um, of the device we were using to measure, so we couldn't get some reliable results. So uh, over the last month or two, I've been working on preparing a reliable way to produce a lot thicker films, and we were able to generate um, these capacitor structures here. So the dielectric, um, yes, laser pointer. Ugh. So the dielectric uh, is that white line in between sort of the metal and the glass wafer, and it has a thickness of about 200 micrometers. Uh, and right now, we measure the dielectric constant to be 3.46. And to compare that to something like silicon dioxide, the dielectric constant is 3.9. Um, and the other uh, polyvinylene fluoride, the uh, ferroelectric polymer I mentioned earlier, it has a dielectric constant of 8.4, measuring at 1 megahertz. Um, right now, we haven't done any sort of ACE, like uh, different frequency measurements of FPC6. So we don't really know yet whether or not it's going to be ferroelectric, um, because it took actually a long time to figure out how to make these thicker films um, a lot easier. So to summarize my talk, um, this molecule FPC6 forms chains through four CHO hydrogen bonds and pi pi interactions. It displays viscoelastic behavior. Um, it can be easily processed and printed, and it behaves like a dielectric. And it may be ferroelectric due to the residual order in one dimension, but we still have some work to do to uh, figure that out. Thanks very much, everybody.